So in the last page of uh, the first section, Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala, talking about how to get this knowledge of belief, which he's, uh, ek, 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 what do you call it, elaborating on. So this knowledge of belief, uh, He's saying if you want the real knowledge of belief, it, it won't come through just studying. So I'm trying to paraphrase and summarize what he's saying in around two, three pages. So he's saying this knowledge of belief will not come just like this. We talked about this in a very lengthy chapter in Al-Ihya. So you can read there more about it. But here, he's saying, this is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it comes with a price. And what is this, this price? And this is where my focus will be, inshallah. So he's saying that, بحقائق هذه العقيدة من غير مجمجة ولا مراقبة فلا تضعف إلا في بعض كتبنا المضمون بها على غير أهلها. So if you want a straightforward statement about this knowledge, this very specific knowledge, you you will find some of it, some hints, yes, and no one can can get it but those who are uh, specialized in this area. And then he said, you need to have three things in order, to, in order to get this knowledge. Number one, you have to master the sciences. Uh, he called it Al-Ulum Al-Zahira. Al-Ulum Al-Zahira, it means the outward sciences. Outward sciences, he means the language, Arabic language, the details of the Arabic language, you have to have knowledge about the Quran, the Sunnah, etc. This is what they call Ulum Zahira. So the outward knowledge. And so he's not just suggesting this, he says you have to master it, to master it. And number two, he said your heart has to completely uh, refrain from the dunya. after you uh, have as well controlled all the bad traits in you. So he's talking about something very high, very difficult to achieve. This is why he's saying it's not that easy, but if you want me to give you some hints, I will. And the third one, he's saying that you have to have uh, Good fitra. Good fitra, it means uh, pure innate, which Allah has created in you. And not only this, you have to have as well clear mind and a smart uh, intelligence. Again, he is talking about very high level. And then he finished with this statement, which is the summary of everything he mentioned here, if you want. I'll read the Arabic first and then take you to the English. He says, فَلَنْ يَصْلُحَ لِقْتِبَاسِ أَنْوَارِ الْمَعْرِفَةِ الْحَقِيقِيَّةِ إِلَّا قَلْبٌ صَافٍ كَأَنَّهُ مِرْآةٌ مَجْلُوَّةٌ وَإِنَّمَا يَصِيرُ كَذَلِكَ بِقُوَّةِ الْفِطْرَةِ so this is the difficult part, but I'll take you through this. So he's saying, Rahimullah, only a pure heart is suited 
to take from the light of true realization. So the, the, he means here by the true realization, it means the essence of knowledge, the knowledge which Allah has gifted to his awliya, to his uh, selected people, to uh, the close people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is what he's referring to, or what he's referring to here is the true knowledge. Every other knowledge, he doesn't classify as the true knowledge. It's a knowledge, but the true knowledge, whatever you come across this uh, terminology, it means the knowledge which relates to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the hereafter and the unseen. So only a pure heart is suited to take from the light of true realization as if it were an immaculately polished mirror. So this heart has to be like a very, very polished mirror, like a polished mirror. It means, again, he's, he's talking about the uh, reception. So this knowledge is descending from Allah Azza wa Jal. Um, how to receive it? The heart is the receiver. So if the heart was stuffed with the dunya, he can't get this knowledge. If the heart was stained with sins, he can't get this knowledge. And this is why he's referring to the polished, polished mirror. Mir'atun majluwa. Majluwa. It means very clean, polished and shiny mirror. And this is why he mentioned earlier that the dunya has to be kicked out of this heart. Otherwise, he won't get it. So it's like a polished mirror. And this is not something new, by the way, to talk about the heart like a polished mirror. All the awliya and the scholars of uh, tasawwuf or spirituality, all of them refers to the heart uh, as a mirror. And based on the hadith which the Prophet says, Allah wa inna fil qalbi, Allah wa inna fil yasadi mudra, Ida salahat salaha al jasadu kullu, wa ida fasadat fasad al jasadu kullu, Allah wa hi al qalb. Truly in the body there is a morsel of flesh. If it's whole, the body is whole. And if it's diseased, the body is diseased. Truly it's the heart. So the heart is the core of our body and the core of our life, if you want, the physical and the spiritual. So this is why he's referring to, and all the scholars of spirituality as well refer to the heart like a mirror. So it reflects the light of Allah Azza wa Jal, and through this light you can see. You can see what others can't see. You can reach what others can't reach through this light. So as long as we polish this mirror and we keep polishing it, and the Prophet ﷺ in the hadith, he says, إِنَّ الْقُلُوبَ لَتَصْدَعْ كَصَدَعِ الْحَدِيدِ So truly the hearts will uh, become rusty like iron does. And they asked the Prophet ﷺ, uh, and how do we polish it, Ya Rasulullah? وَمَا جَلَاؤُهَا And the Prophet ﷺ says, a lot of dhikr and remembrance of death. So remembrance of death will soften the heart and dhikr will soften the heart. As well, the dhikr under the dhikr, which is a big title, under dhikr you have a lot of istighfar, a lot of uh, la ilaha illallah, and tasbih and tahleel and tamjid and takbir and, and the, the rest of these azkar which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi used to, to do on a daily basis. So you can see what he is referring to here. As well, Ibn Atta'Allah secondary, Rahimahullah, he talks about the heart beautifully in, in a very uh, beautiful uh, hikmah uh, in his book, Al-Hikam. He says, uh, كَيْفَ يُشْرِقُ قَلْبٌ 
صور الأكوان منطبعة في مرآته. Again, he refers to the heart. Of course, don't forget between the Imam Al Ghazali and Imam Ibn Atta Allah secondary around four four hundred years, sort of give or take. So Imam Al Ghazali passed away five o five. He was born four fifty Hijri. رحمه الله ابن عطاء الله is in the seventh or eighth century هجري so around three hundred years sort of so he is referring to to the heart by saying how come you expect a heart to shine i.e. with the light of Allah عز وجل with the light of this knowledge whilst the mirror of this heart is reflecting the dunya inside it you see again the same the same thing they are just speaking the same language uh, from different angles if you want so if the heart is full of the dunya then the mirror is blocked or stained or rusty or uh, full of uh, filth and the like of it so Again, Ghazali rahimahullah is saying only a pure heart is suited to take from this special light. And this special light will reflect on the polished mirror, it means on the heart. If the heart was not polished, if this mirror was not polished, then don't dream about this knowledge. You won't get it. As simple as that. So he is giving you the good news and the bad news. And that only occurs to someone with a strong nature and correct intention. So listen to what he's saying. So if you want to look after your heart, you want to get rid of the dunya, you want to have this light to, coming, to come to your heart, okay. You worked on polishing your heart. You worked on uh, getting rid of the attachment to the dunya. He's not just suggesting in any shape or form, by the way, to uh, isolate yourself from the dunya. No, it's not what he's saying. But not to be attached to the dunya. And he's saying that will happen to someone with a strong nature. I'm just going to start making the pastor. Intention. Okay. Yeah. So strong nature and correct intention, uh, important to uh, consider here, okay? So intention, it goes without saying, is, is the core of any action actually. As the Prophet in the hadith says, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ Actions are but by intention. So the actions are heavily relying on the intention. So you have, you have the right intention and you have a strong heart and strong uh, will. This is what he is referring to, the strong nature. Yes? So the Arabic says, إِنَّمَا يَصِيرُ كَذَلِكَ بِقُوَّةِ الْفِطْرَةِ وَصِحَّةِ الْقَصْدِ قُوَّةِ الْفِطْرَةِ It means the strong nature. So he has to be strong. Not necessarily physically, although physically is fine. But uh, more importantly is uh, his patience, his sabr, his uh, resilience, his... Uh, uh, will, this is the, the most important thing. And the intention. So what are you after here is the intention. Okay. So you are trying to get rid of all these attachments and to the dunya and this and that. Okay, what do you want out of it? I want to be a wali and then I get some supernatural power and then I will be a special person. And then I can assure you, you won't get any of that. 
Why? Because you have the wrong intention. You don't get that. Yes? So getting the right intention, it means to become closer to Allah, to become uh, among his uh, chosen people, to be uh, obedient more to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to have his love, azza wa jal, and yes, this is the right intention. And then he says, ثُمَّ بِإِزَالَةِ كُدُرَاتِ الدُّنْيَا عَنْ وَجْهِ And after removing the filth, yes, he used this word, kudurat, which is, can be translated as filth, filth of the material world from his face. His face, not his face, the face of the heart, it means. Because this is the first layer where it covers the heart. So you need to, like uh, I refer to this many times, like the curtains. So the curtains are uh, the preventers of the light to come through. So if you want the light to come through, then you have to open the curtains. So this is the filth where it covers the heart. And this filth here is about uh, worldly things is about the material stuff, is about dunya, is about money, is about uh, desires, ego, migo, all these kind of things, just stuffing on the heart, covering the heart and, and preventing the light to come through the heart. In order to get that light to penetrate it, then you have to work on removing the clutter, decluttering your heart from the dunya. So he's saying to remove the filth of the material world from the face of your heart, if you want. From the face of your heart, i.e. The, the top layer of your heart, where it's receiving directly the, the light from Allah Azza wa Jal in, in that uh, special knowledge. And then he's explaining more about it. He's saying, So, for indeed, it's by a hardness of the natural disposition that Allah prevents hearts from knowing him. And then he quoted an ayah from the Quran that Allah intervenes between a man and his heart. So what does it mean? Here, we, we have seen many verses similar to this in the Quran. Uh, like for instance, uh, They stated that our hearts are locked locked yes so we have different kinds of hearts some hearts are locked some hearts are like rocks some hearts are soft some hearts are polished some hearts and so on so we have different levels of hearts different kinds of hearts uh, some white like uh, the marble strong and shiny and some is overturned like an overturned vessel again from the hadith which uh, imam muslim narrated in his sahih so by removing the dunya and the attachment to the dunya from the heart then you are unlocking the heart in another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well was describing the disbelievers and the munafiqeen sometimes. It depends on the scenario. Uh, no, indeed, uh, what they have earned, it blocked their hearts. So their earnings, their actions, which they have done in their own hands, it blocked their hearts. So Allah Azza wa is giving us a clear 
explanation how the heart can be locked because Allah Azza wa Jal will not at all lock someone's heart if he's a good person if he's doing the right thing if he's working hard to uh, disconnect himself from the material world not to be attached to this dunya but to work in the dunya to deal with it but not to uh, sink in it so Allah will not uh, block anyone's heart unless they are doing the wrong thing and this is exactly what uh, verses are saying so their hearts were locked because of their actions as simple as that so don't think for a second that Allah will lock someone's heart if he's too good and he's doing the right thing and then Allah locked his heart no his action will decide which heart he become his actions so, or her actions, if his or her actions were the right actions, then Allah will open the heart. If they were working towards the evil actions, then definitely this will lock the heart. It's not a rocket science. So Allah Azza wa Jal is warning us and don't earn the evil actions because these evil actions will lock your heart. And if the heart is locked, you are the furthest from Allah. As in the hadith, uh, the furthest heart from Allah is the heedless heart. Heedless heart. Al-Ghafil. And Allahi, which is immersed in the joy of the dunya. He is not in any shape or form interested in the akhirah, the hereafter. All what he's after this heart is the enjoyment of the dunya and the, the uh, desires of the dunya and these kind of things so this will affect badly the heart of course so the rahimahullah imam al-ghazali he summarized this in in these two lines two lines in arabic in english it's more and in two lines he summarized uh, if you want uh, the way to be closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when the heart is open when the light is coming and reflecting on the heart then all goodness will be in that heart be it knowledge be it wisdom be it generosity be it kindness be it mercy be it you name it you name it so this is why you have kind hearts and you have harsh hearts you have kind people and you have harsh people so harsh people usually usually have harsh hearts but sometimes you might have some people who are harsh, but in, inside their heart, they are kind. Or probably because of historical things, because of uh, upbringing, because of the environment or the experience or something along these lines, they became harsh, not because their heart is harsh. But these are the exceptions. Usually kind-hearted people are kind and harsh-hearted people are harsh, usually. So, and the heart, by the way, is, is where Allah Azza wa Jal uh, will be looking. In the hadith, in Allah la yanzuru ila suwarikum, Allah does not look at your appearance, your shape, or your uh, possessions, or properties, or money, or wealth, these kind of things. But He looks at your hearts and your actions. 
this is the most important thing to Allah Azza wa Jal, not as us. So you see this comparison between us as humans and between Allah as the creator. How do we judge people which is wrong? I know, but we all do this. We usually judge people according to their appearance, to their wealth. Yes? Allah is not like this. Allah will not judge people according to their appearance or to their wealth. Allah will judge people according to their hearts, to their actions, which is the real judgment. Of course, we shouldn't judge anyone. Allah is the one who will judge everyone. So the, the difference is huge between our approach and the Creator's approach, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why, by the way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, made his awliya hidden. His awliya, the close people, the special people to Allah Azza wa Jal, he made them hidden, uh, not known to everyone. Why? Because he doesn't want you to recognize them and judge according to their appearance. If there's a badge, yeah, this is an awali and you can recognize him or her. No. Only Allah recognizes his awliya and some awliya recognize each other as well. So he made his awliya hidden. So you might see somebody who's very, very, very posh in his dresses, in his, I don't know what, appearance, and he might be awali. Don't say he's into dunya, he's I don't know what, and then you judge him or her. He might be among his awliya, you never know. And you might see somebody who's um, just normal person, not very uh, appealing, not very famous. Um, and he might be one of his awliya, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you never know. It's all about the heart. So we need to work on our hearts. Then the message here is clear. Then work on your hearts and inshallah you can get more and more of the, the special knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So knowledge in general is divided into two main divisions. One which is uh, acquired knowledge, ilm kasbi, which we call it, and gifted knowledge, and ilm wahbi. Al ilm al kasbi, the acquired knowledge, you work to get it. You attend classes, you read, you do research, you ask questions, and this and that, you memorize, you write down uh, comments and so on. This is how you acquire knowledge, which is definitely required. Uh, <clears throat> this is, uh, it needs efforts. The second part of it is the gifted knowledge. Gifted knowledge is not about your efforts, but Allah will reward you for your efforts, not necessarily, because of your efforts, Allah will reward you with that knowledge. And this is alim wahbi. So it's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And both of these uh, parts, Allah has mentioned in the very first revelation, where he says, Iqra' bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Iqra' it's uh, acquired knowledge. So you have to put efforts, you have to read and, and learn. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. Iqra wa rabbuka al-akram. Alladhi allama bil-qalam. The one who taught with the pen. This is where you write down, you learn, you ask questions. Yeah. So this is the efforts, uh, acquired knowledge. Alladhi allama bil-qalam. So he taught a man what he doesn't know. This is the uh, Wahbi knowledge, the gifted 
knowledge. So alam al insana ma lam yalam. It's not up to you. It's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I can give you a very quick example. Sometimes you read an equation or a line or an article or a passage or you name it. You read it and you get it first time. And sometimes you repeat it 10 times and you don't understand. What is it? Because understanding is not in your hand. You can read, but you cannot guarantee understanding. Understanding is from Allah Azza wa Jal. This is why in the hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ Whoever Allah uh, wishes good for, he gives him understanding of the deen. So the understanding is a gift from Allah Azza wa Jal. But it won't come without a price. You have to work for it. You have to ask for it. You have to make dua for it. You have to strive to get it and to have sincerity, the right intention, and consistency, and patience, and uh, the etiquettes, and uh, dua, and all of this has to come with it. Yes, and according to your ikhlas, your sincerity, Allah will open the way for you. Some people will get 5%, some people will get 2%, some people will get 10%, some people will have 50%, 70%, all depends on the purity of the heart, the intention, and the efforts, and the sabr, and the etiquettes, and how much you want it. As we say in English, how badly you want it. So you need it badly, you need it with a strong conviction, then do your best. So the pure heart will be able to have this knowledge which related to Allah and his messengers and the unseen and his book and his uh, attributes and so on. Only the pure heart because Allah will not gift this knowledge to those who doesn't deserve it. Be careful. Allah will not gift this knowledge to those who doesn't deserve it. So it's a very special gift. And if you have a special gift, you choose the right person to give it to him. And this is what we do usually. <clears throat> so you, you, you keep the, the best gift to the best people. Yes? So you don't take the best gift and give it to somebody who doesn't deserve it. Somebody who will not acknowledge the, the importance of this or not appreciate it or not uh, use it or value it. You don't do that. And Allah Azza wa Jal, of course, is better in judgment than us. Without doubt, our judgment may be many times wrong, but Allah's judgment is always right. So he will gift it to those who deserve it. So how can you prove that you deserve this? The Ghazali, rahimahullah, from his experience, he's telling you, if you want to, to get this knowledge, then follow my lead, I can tell you. I'm giving you the shortcut, uh, some tips how to get there. Because he's the expert, I tell you. He started his knowledge uh, on the wrong footing. His intention was not to seek knowledge. His intention was to have shelter and um, food and, and uh, sustenance. On the top of it, he was accommodated in... in uh, uh, Sharia school where they taught him 
Arabic, Quran, Sunnah, and so on and so forth. And then later, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because of, of the purity of his heart, and he worked on this, by the way, he opened, Allah opened the way for him. And he summarized his journey by saying, uh, we thought uh, uh, this knowledge not for the sake of Allah, but Allah made it for his sake. So he's talking about his, his uh, journey in, in, uh, in knowledge. Rahimahullah ta'ala. So if we want to get the real knowledge then, we have to have the purity of the heart. And this is all we'll discuss uh, more when we get to section three and section four in the book. Section three will talk about the bad traits and uh, characteristics which we should avoid and get rid of it, like envy, like uh, uh, arrogance and so on. And uh, section four will talk about the good character, good character, kindness and gentleness and mercy and these kind of things. So th that's in general what he's saying or summarizing in, in this uh, chapter here, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Then he started uh, section number two, Rahimahullah. We can start section number two if you want, or we can pause here and open the floor for your questions, up to you. Section number two, he's uh, talking about Salah. So after he talks about, uh, after he talked about uh, attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the main attributes or so the belief uh, in, in these attributes, uh, his power, his will, his knowledge and so on. So he now moved to talk about salah, the importance of salah and uh, and again this is in line with with the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam when he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam and this was in Medina, more likely towards the end of his life, alayhi salatu a few years, probably a couple of years before his death. And he posed these questions to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, O oh Muhammad, tell me about Islam, O oh Muhammad, tell me about Iman, O oh Muhammad, tell me about Ihsan. And then he said, tell me about the hour. And then he said, tell me about the signs of the hour. Uh, and that's how he finished uh, these questions. So in this, these 40 principles, Imam al-Ghazali mostly he covered uh, the hadith, these uh, main uh, pillars in the hadith, it's been covered in this. So yes, under Islam, which he called here Imam al Ghazali. Uh, he called Al A'mal al Zahira, the outward actions. So, this is the second section in the book, and he called it outward actions, and it's 10. 10. He put in the first section as well, under each, we, we said we have four sections. Each section has 10 uh, divisions. So the first section has 10 divisions, the second section has 10 divisions, the third and the fourth as well. So in total, uh, we have 40 principles. And the number 40 has, has a long story, but to summarize it, and the scholars used to uh, collect 40 uh, hadiths, 40 this, 40 that, uh, it has, it has some essence in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Although it has some weakness in it, but many other narrations comes together 
to make it uh, a valid hadith to a certain extent, to be honest. So this is where the 40 comes from, or uh, the 40 as well has been mentioned in the story of uh, Musa alayhi salam, that Allah asked Musa to seclude himself for 30 days and then he topped it up with 10 days, so it's 40. Arba'una layla. So the number 40 has some, some uh, reflection, especially in the spiritual uh, practice. So again, uh, under this we have 10 sections. Uh, but yes, number one, he mentioned the salah. And we'll see what's under the salah. So the first uh, the first principle is salah. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَأَقِمُ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِ And establish the salah to remember me. So in this ayah, Allah Azza wa Jal is commanding us to establish the salah, yes? And the core of the Salah is to be in the remembrance uh, state, not heedlessness, not forgetfulness. But unfortunately, many of us, when we pray, we are on different planets sometimes. So we forget, which is completely the opposite of the ayah. The ayah is saying the Salah brings a remembrance to you of Allah Azza wa Jal and uh, to be focused. أَقِمُ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِي Establish the prayer to remember me. For my remembrance, you, you, you have to establish the prayer. And in the hadith, the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam says, الصَّلَاةُ عِمَادُ الدِّينِ الصَّلَاةُ عِمَادُ الدِّينِ The salah is the pillar of the deen. So, of course, there's no other ibadah higher than the salah. The salah is the core of our ibadah. Nothing matches salah in our ibadah, I tell you. So this is not from me, I'm telling you. This is from the, the Quran and the Sunnah. So nothing matches the salah in ibadah. As salatu imaduddin as uh, Bayhaqi narrated this hadith, uh, it's part of a longer hadith. So we see the Quran and the Sunnah. Of course, and definitely this is a summary. Otherwise, there are plenty of verses in the Quran about the Salah, plenty of hadith in the Sunnah about the Salah. But he's, as he promised, that he's, a sum, he's giving us a summary here. And then he said, Rahimahullah ta'ala, وَاعْلَمْ أَنَّكَ فِي صَلَاتِكَ مُنَاجٍ رَبَّكَ فَانْظُرْ كَيْفَ تُصَّلِي You have to know that whilst you are praying, you are conversing with your Lord. مُنَاجٍ And this, this word has as a special as well uh, use in the spiritual world. مُنَاجَات And this is why Imam al uh, Ibn Atta'Allah secondary in his last chapter of the book Al-Hikam, he wrote a special section called Al-Munajat, Al-Munajat Al-Ilahiyya, Divine Discourse. So it's, it's a discourse between him and Allah Azza wa Jal. I advise you to read it, it's beautiful. Uh, some of it, probably it's a bit difficult for some of you to understand, but uh, inshallah we might do another course on that. Previously, we delivered two courses, or three courses actually, between London and Leeds on uh, selection from Al-Hikam al ataiya Inshallah, we can do and deliver this again, Inshallah Ta'ala. So he says, uh, when you are praying, you should know that you have a discourse between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have a conversation between you and your Lord. فَانْظُرْ كَيْفَ تُصَلِّي So you have to be careful how to pray. You are conversing with Allah, your Lord, your sustainer, your creator. So, 
if you have a meeting with an important person and you have a conversation with them, how do you do? Prepare yourself beforehand, prepare your appearance, you prepare yourself, you put, you take a shower, you just put perfume, you comb your hair, you look after yourself, you wear the best dress and you look at yourself in the mirror and back and forth and you rehearse what to say, what to do, how to say it, how to, I don't know what. And this is if you are meeting an important person in the dunya. So every time we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so we have this a conversation with Allah in our salah. And he's the king of the kings, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the true Lord, the true king, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So be careful how to talk to him. Be careful how to address him. Be careful how to converse with him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's, it's an important uh, concept to understand. So Allah did not say, pray in the Quran. Allah says, aqim as salah. Any difference between sallu and aqim as salah? Yes. He could have said, sallu. Yes, pray. Well, he didn't say pray. He said, aqim as salah. And in many verses in the Quran, iqam as salah. In the hadith as well, many times, iqam as salah. He didn't say as salah. He did say iqam as salah. So to establish the prayer. So iqam, it's from qawama in Arabic. Qawama, it means to straighten something. If it's bendy, you straighten it. And this process, in Arabic, we call it iqam. Taqweem, you straighten it, you make it straight. Yes. So salah has to straighten our uh, character and our actions and our direction. It gives us direction because it's straight on the straight path. Aqim salah. So it's so crucial. And unfortunately, we, we keep and we tend to forget about this. Uh, when we start our salah, we have some uh, distractions, we have some uh, probably, we forget about where we are, what have we done with the salah, with shraka and so on. So we need to improve our salah, this is so important. And then he says, uh, Rahimahullah, you have to observe three things in your salah. To be among those who are observing their salah and, and preserving and protecting their salah. And to be accounted or to be counted amongst those who are establishing their salah, not just praying. Allah Azza wa Jal. Uh, repeated many times in the Quran, Aqim as salah wa Aqim as salah. And he didn't say pray, he did say Aqim as salah or Aqim as salah in the plural form or the uh, singular form. And he prays subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. Those who uh, observe the salah and pray on time. وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِهِ وَهُمْ عَلَىٰ صَلَاتِهِمْ يُحَاصِرُونَ So those who believe in the Akhirah, they believe in Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they protect their Salah. It means they pray on time, they do not waste their Salah, they do not sleep on their Salah deliberately, they do not forget their Salah deliberately. So this is so important to consider, to keep in mind, to uh, put in practice as well. And then he started counting what are the three things which you have to keep uh, to observe <clears throat> in order to protect your salah. Inshallah, we'll postpone this uh, to, to next time. And now the floor is yours. You can ask uh, 
Yeah, any question? First, the relevant questions. Topic, and then you can ask irrelevant questions if we have some time, inshallah. Um, you were talking about the awliya and um, how some of them recognize others and some of them uh, are hidden or don't know who they are. So do you sort of, can you end up with an awliya club? People, awliya who stick together and awliya who, and do they discuss awliya matters or do they not discuss them because then they lose them? But I won't call it Awliya Club, but yes, when, when Awliya meets with each other, they speak a special language, it's airy fairy to you. You sit down and you look at the ceiling, you don't understand what they are discussing. Yeah, I came across this a couple of times or something like that. And they speak a language which you don't understand, yes. Are there any more questions? Sheikh, could you, do you get ch children who are Olia and do you get new converts who go shooting straight from not knowing about Islam but with their purity become Olia quickly? Uh, let me tell you, Wilaya is not one level. Wilaya has many levels. So we have the general level, you have the specific level. General level, those who observe the salah will be considered as awliya. And this is a good news for every one of us, for me and you and everyone, inshallah. We observe our salah and keep uh, praying on time and, and uh, do our best to deliver our salah in the best form, inshallah. And there is uh, the other uh, level or division, let's say, which is the specific wilaya. Specific wilaya, it has different ranks, different ranks. So it's like a skyscraper. And so can, can those people then enter? Do they, are you just saying that people who enter Islam will be on the bottom level? Is that what you're saying? Or bottom level or children? That's that's definitely fine. And at least you you are you are among those who are special to Allah. So don't be sad on bottom level. And then it it takes a lot to be on the top level in anything. In anything, you can't start your business and oh, overnight. Man. Uzma has a question. And overnight, you be uh, the the CEO. You can't. It takes time and efforts and, and knowledge and practice okay. and experience and what have you. Yes, Uzma. Okay, um, Sheikh, my question was, uh, you know how you're saying that only the pure hearts can receive the knowledge and the heedless hearts are the furthest away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, I mean, I, like a lot of us are in the middle where our hearts are in between remembrance and a lot of the time they're in heedlessness. So is, is that why sometimes our efforts are half-hearted because we're kind of toing and froing between one and the other? How do we kind of step it up? Yeah, you asked that question, you answered the question. <laughs> yeah, exactly, we are at the, 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 some point like that. We are in between and coming back and forth and then and, and falling down and then getting up and asking for a step far and tawbah and then and this is part and parcel of our struggle and our test. So how, how do we get to the next level where we're more in remembrance and perhaps less? Focus. It needs focus. Okay. When you are, uh, for instance, close to the uh, days of test, 
you drop everything usually if you want to pass the test you drop everything you lock yourself uh, inside your room or now you are locked up anyway so you you focus on your studies you do a special uh, uh, schedule to finish what you have to do regarding uh, the exams and you have deadlines to meet and you you plan in a different way why because you have an exam as as well if you have for instance a driving test many of us do definitely know what does it mean you have this anxiety and i i want to focus i need to remember this 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 so you go through everything before you go to the exam yes and mm -hmm. the driving instructor tells you before you do the practical don't forget this, don't forget this. He, he will ask you about this, he will ask you about this. Da, da, da. You prepare yourself, yes? Mm -hmm. But if it wasn't uh, for the exam day, you will forget and then you will just be relaxed and forget about everything because you don't have focus. When we focus, we deal with it and we pass the exam, we go to level two. But if we don't focus, we don't pass the exam, as simple as that. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yep. Jazakallah. Thank you. You're welcome. Asalaamu Alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum Asalaamu Alaikum. That was such a helpful session, Alhamdulillah. I found it really useful. Um, I have two questions, if I may, actually. So the first one uh, was, um, I was wondering if you could elaborate, please, a little bit on, you said that Ghazali started off, Imam Ghazali started off uh, with uh, not necessarily the intention to please Allah, but he ended up, he got there, uh, and but his initial intention was, was different. Um, uh, and I was wondering whether you could tell us a bit more about when was it that Allah bestowed him with that gift of knowledge, was it before he, he had the intention to please Allah, solely to please Allah, or primarily to please Allah, or was it somewhere along the way? Or, you know, um, Azali, rahimahullah, did not live that much. He lived 55 years on the Hijri uh, calendar. So, rahimahullah ta'ala. And the, the last 10 years of his life, it was in isolation. He's isolated himself from the dunya, from any status, any position, anything. And he got the highest positions in, in dunya, if you want. Uh, he left everything and he went into seclusion for almost 10 years. Uh, and uh, he traveled to different places, but he spent uh, the most of these 10 years in Damascus, in the Umayyad Mosque. And uh, we were fortunate to, to visit that very room and uh, our Sheikh Abdul Razak Al Halabi, Rahimahullah. He once uh, de m m delivered a session in, in that. So he secluded himself for 10 years and then he became, after that, he wrote that, that book, Hiya Ulum al he wrote it in that time. Oh, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> and uh, 40, which we are reading now, he wrote it at that time. Before, okay. before the, the last books he has written is one of it, this one which we are reading now. My understanding was that just before he went on, the reason why he went off on this period of seclusion was that he was already very well respected yes. in the community. Yes. So Allah had already bestowed him with this gift. Sorry. Listen, he was suffering uh, from the intention that yes, yes. you have, yes. Uh, you are a ce celebrity now. But uh, this is what I'm after. No, I'm not after being a celebrity. I'm not after uh, the, mm -hmm. uh, competing on, on dunya issues and uh, levels of the um, dunya yeah. and uh, yeah. leadership. So what you dunya. said just makes sense now, actually, you that see. it was only oh. once he cleansed him, himself of this intent, he changed his intention, and that's when Allah gave him all the gifts of this knowledge, yeah. and he produced all these amazing works for us. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay, that that's really helpful because otherwise, it's actually really disparaging. Had it not been this way around, it would actually be very discouraging for us because actually it would be okay. So he didn't have this pure intention, and he still was such a great scholar and great um, 
you know, he, he's, he's still producing all these about, works. He's not so, talking about everything he has done, it was with the wrong intention. No, he never meant this. And yeah. of course, it, it's, it's not possible with every single action he was with the wrong intention. But he yeah. felt that many of these things, uh, the intention was keep changing and this and that. So he wanted to sort this out. So he took this mm -hmm. time out to just focus. Okay, alhamdulillah. That's really, really helpful. Thank you so much. That, that really clarifies. So that, sorry, that was, uh, that was quite long. I apologize. That was my first question. And I think because that was, that was, <laughs> I got so stuck into it. I've totally forgotten my second question. So I'll just let, let somebody else take the floor. And if I remember, inshallah, I'll ask you. Jazakallah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I just remembered my second question. <laughs> if okay. nobody else wanted to ask another one, if that's okay. Uh, you're telling Uzma about uh, focus, and earlier you're talking about um, uh, one of the things that Ghazali mentioned um, alongside, obviously, intention, etc., and consistency was um, resilience and willpower, um, or uh, was that paraphrased slightly? How do you have any tips for how can we develop this um, this focus? So, is there anything else other than Salah, obviously? Um, what would be if we want to prioritize because sometimes we feel so overwhelmed or some of us feel so overwhelmed that there's so many things that we could do and prioritize on what could be maybe the second thing or the third thing that we could then prioritize after salah and really trying trying to do that next as the second and third thing simple it's the daily asgar which the prophet salah and used to do that's it this is this is how he used to get uh, the focus and teaches his companions how to to be focused through the daily adhkar. So daily adhkar. Okay. In between, after the salah, before the salah, entering the house, leaving the house, going to the mosque, leaving the mosque, uh, riding your car, driving, etc. Uh, and this, inshallah, we'll probably elaborate on this more in our course, uh, all about dua. So we'll take you through this journey, inshallah ta'ala. So okay. yes, the dua, the daily azkar, the daily remembrances, it, if it's been done with the right intention, with the right focus, it brings tranquility and focus uh, uh, into your day. And if your day is fully focused, then your week is fully focused, your life is fully focused. Jazakallah. Okay, that's, that's quite helpful. So that above Quran, even maybe the daily adhkar, like as a priority. Oh, Listen, adhkar is including Quran, of course. Mm -hmm. But adhkar really needs to take priority then. Yes, that's that's the that's the big definitely, one. Definitely, definitely, yes, yes. Okay. It's more than the social media. <laughs> yeah, I, I know people yeah. will give preference to social media over adhkar. Yeah, I'm not and, really. Uh, and yeah. you, you've been okay. exposed. All of us by the new technology in the iPhone, how many hours you spend on your iPhone. Yeah. It tells you three hours. Ah, three <laughs> hours. Okay. You see what I'm saying? And yes. check how much you have spent on your phone, productive or not productive. The, not, the productive bit, it's the, the uh, orange color. It's very, very <laughs> small. A few minutes and I'm productive is whoosh covering the whole thing so stop clicking through the social media does it matter if we don't learn the duas for a while and if we do, we're just reading them like the way we uh, like just reading them off uh, of something so off the fortress that's, that's or fine. the more you read them the more you memorize them inshallah Okay, any other question? If you have no other questions, then we can, inshallah, finish with Dahar based on that. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Salatu wa salamu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa alayhi wa sahbihi 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 wa s
ربنا اغفر لنا وارحمنا واسامحنا واعفنا واعف عنا ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة واقنا عذاب النار اللهم إنا نسألك العفو والعافية والمعافاة الدائمة في الدين والدنيا والآخرة ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم يا الله purify our intentions purify our hearts help us to be more focused يا الله يا رب العالمين make us closer to you يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله make us among people of remembrance not people of heedlessness يا الله يا رب العالمين enlighten our hearts with the knowledge that makes us closer to you يا الله يا الله يا Give us tranquility and peace and serenity, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Give relief to those who are suffering everywhere, Ya Allah. Cure our illnesses, the physical, the mental, and the spiritual, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, Ya Allah. Forgive our parents, our teachers, our offsprings, our spouses, our students, our loved ones, Salli wa sallam wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa ashma'in Ameen, ameen, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh